I would like for us to consider the word perspective. If you were to look in the dictionary for that word, you would find there's three really good, I thought, definitions that apply to what we're talking about this evening. It would be described as a particular way of regarding something. The capacity to view things in their true relations or relative importance. A third one I thought was really good was the interrelation of things that make the whole more true or more clear. Now being a business person in a business setting, there's really good examples of that. And usually you'll talk about different, a multitude of people surrounding, I used to say an elephant. I, I use the business, I mean a building, because I don't know why you'd have four business guys circled around an elephant looking at it. It didn't make any sense. But it's, the concept is that you have multiple people looking at something big from their viewpoint. And let's just try to imagine that you had a giant building, you're standing right up against it on one side, and you see a building with all of these windows. And there's a guy on the other side where there's no windows, but there's only one door. So he's describing the building as a giant building with a door. So as you begin to compare several people's perspectives only based on the silo that they're looking at, you get a little bit distorted view, but the more whole, the more true, the more clear picture of that thing is when you take all of those things into perspective. You see a big building with lots of windows on one side, a door on another side, and that type of thing. So you might be asking yourselves, what does that have to do with our study tonight? Well, I think it is because sometimes we, I, get somewhat guilty of maybe looking at things individually. We study things and we study them very deeply, but sometimes we forget to come back together and pull all of those things together and consider them as their whole. And I think when we do that, we get a much clearer picture. And when we don't do that, we lose the full impact and the full understanding of that particular topic. So that's what I'd like for us to do this evening is to focus on this. And I'd like for us to consider three components that are part of the plan that we read earlier. To meditate on them for a while and then at the beginning, I mean at the end of this study, to quietly ask ourselves, so what? What does it mean to me? So, the three words that I'm going to ask you to focus on this evening are going to be glory, humility, and love. I'm always nervous. I have to look back and make sure it's there. We need a screen in the back so you can see. Um, so I'd like for us to consider those three words. But before we get into that, I'd like for us to go back and refer to the plan that we read. I kind of debated whether to call this lesson uh, to title it The Plan or God's Plan, but I really wanted us to draw focus on this component of it, the cost of that plan and what, it, what the price was. So we're not going to read this because, uh, for the sake of time because it's a rather lengthy reading, but I would like for us to go through and pull out some key highlights and key notes from this passage. We see in verse 3 that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We also see in verse 4 that this plan was created before the foundations of the world were laid, as Trey mentioned in his prayer, and I truly appreciate that. Verse 5, we see that the plan included our adoption as sons through Christ. Because of that, the plan was that we would be holy and without blame. Verse 6, we find that we were, are accepted. Where? In the beloved, in Christ. That that's where our acceptance is. Verse 7, redemption and forgiveness in Christ through his blood. Verse 9, we find that God has made the mystery of his will known. We don't have to guess. He's clear, clearly demonstrated and revealed that to us in the word. Verse 10, that in the fullness of time, that he would gather all things together in Christ, and Christ would submit those back to the Father again, and then he would reign forever. 
we have also, we find in verse 11, that we have obtained an inheritance. We can partake in that. We can, as adopted sons, that is our inheritance. We look in verse 13 that we have access to this through hearing, believing, and trusting the word of truth. And then finally, in verse 14, as the passage wraps up, he has given us the Holy Spirit as his guarantee. So, when we look at that, if we were to go back and to look at the entire Bible, from Genesis all the way through, through that lens, thinking that that was God's plan from the beginning, things didn't happen by accident, they don't just coincidentally happen and God tries to make the best of them and make it all fit together, that that was the plan from the very beginning. What do you mean by the beginning? I mean the very beginning, before the foundations of the world were even laid. So if we were to look through this, we find that this was part of God's eternal plan. The first time we really see this is, is very, very early in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3, 15, we start to see the plan being referred to as God's talking to the serpent after Adam and Eve's sin. We see it reflected in the promises to Abraham. Very key to that. We also see it reflected in the promises to David, that through his seed, that through his descendants, there would be a king rise that would rule and reign forever. We see it talked about uh, in, by all the prophets, all the way from Isaiah, all the way through all the Psalms and through the major and the minor prophets. We continue to see over and over and over and over again the plan being referred to. So when we look at this in the entirety, we have that Old Testament as the tutor, as our schoolmaster, to lead us to that point and to get us ready. But it was all focused, all pointed toward the fulfillment of God's plan for mankind that he put together before the foundations of the earth. We also see now when we start moving through into the New Testament in John chapter 1 verse 14, we'll look at in just a minute, that that the Messiah, that Jesus came to earth and was born of man. The Word uh, came to uh, dwelt among men and, and took on flesh. We also see, as we look through, that he was, we see Jesus' baptism to fulfill all righteousness, as we're told in Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 15. We see, as we move through the New Testament, the various components of his ministry and his teaching of his apostles to be able to spread that gospel after his death. We see his, him being denied and betrayed and betrayed by his closest friends, not just those that uh, didn't want to hear, but by his closest friends. We see Peter's denial, Judas's betrayal all through the Gospels. As the Gospels begin to close, we look at, we see him mocked, we see him beaten, we see him stripped of his clothing, we see him spat upon, and finally we see him crucified on the cross. But we also see him resurrected in the Gospels. And we finally see him as the Gospels close, ascending to the right hand of God. Now we're going to look at these other passages you see in the bottom here in just a minute, but I want you to note them now, keeping in mind the plan. And this is where we're going with the next part of our study and the bulk and the core of it this evening, is all of those were done. What we just read, the mocking, the crucifixion, all of that done with every bit of it known in Jesus' mind before and as it played out. And you'll see that very, very clearly in John the 13th chapter a little bit later when we're talking about him washing his disciples' feet. It specifically mentions that before he girded up his, his uh, clothing and got down on his knees that he recalled the power that he had, that God had given him, and that he would get back at some point. Very clearly in his mind. That's what I was talking about perspective. Sometimes we begin to think about the glory and the deity of Christ. And then we study the humanity and the humility and all the different things that Christ does. But sometimes we forget to put those together and think that as he was doing those things, he knew exactly what heights of glory he had and the depths of humility that he was taking on. He hadn't forgotten those things. It was in his mind as they were taking place. That's where I'd like for us to focus on 
this evening. So I'm going to challenge you. Three words seem too easy. So I'm going to put three questions with those words that by the end of our study this evening, I'd like for us to be able to answer. What heights of glory did Jesus have and did he lead? What depths of humility did he take on? And then finally, what amount of love did he demonstrate by doing that? So let's start, if you would, turn with me to John chapter 1. We'll read the first few verses of John chapter 1 as the beginning. There's no better place, I think, as we're talking about the glory and trying to understand and study the glory of Jesus than to start with this passage. John chapter 1, and again, high, uh, ju middle, junior high and middle school kids, you guys ought to be almost quoting these as we're talking through them. These should be very familiar to you. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So as we consider this glory of Jesus, and we began to look a little deeper into what that means, we can start with knowing that these passages clearly indicate that Jesus had an eternal nature. There's no mistaking that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and what? The Word was God. Okay? So as we begin to look at our passages, we can further understand uh, exactly what we mean by that. When we look at John chapter 8, we won't read that again, but for the sake of time. But if you'll recall back, Jesus is talking to the crowd, and the Jews have just accused him of having a demon. And he looks at them and talks to them in verse 49 of John chapter 8, and he says, no, I don't have a demon, but what I do is I honor my father. And he also tells them in verse 51 that anyone that keeps my word never sees death. So what's their reaction? Oh, we get it? No, the reaction is now we know you have a demon because this makes no sense. What do you mean? Abraham and the prophets are dead already. So what are you trying to say? Who are you trying to say that you are? So he replies back to them. He says, I know him, my father. And he refers to that. And then, in fact, he goes on in verse 56 to tell them, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. Now they're really looking at him and going, now you're really crazy. You're not even 50 years old yet, and Abraham's been dead for hundreds of years. What are you trying to say? This is the clincher. When he looks at them and he says, before Abraham was, I am. Have we heard that before? Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, when God's talking to Moses, and he tells him, you know, tell, who, who should I tell him sent me? Tell him, I am. Now, I'm telling you, there was no confusion in the Jews' mind when he was talking to them in this passage in John. He wasn't just saying that he lived before Abraham, and they knew that. They knew by that word that he was claiming eternal nature, that he was claiming to be God. And the reaction was to pick up rocks and to try to stone him because of that. So we see that um, his eternal nature was claimed by himself. We also see in Hebrews chapter 1, he's referring to the promise of David and the prophecies, and he says that he will be a king forever. And then again, we see this kind of looking forward versus backwards in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is about to be stoned, and he looks up and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So again, Jesus' eternal nature is part of that glory. Another part of the glory that we see is that he is the express image of God. And there are multiple passages. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, both are very clearly around the same subject. In him dwells all the fullness, the first one says. 2, 9 says, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we see that Jesus had all the fullness of the Godhead and of God dwelling in him. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> to find something else to slap to make emphasis. 
We see uh, in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, both very, very similar, that Jesus was the image of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 takes it a step further and says he was the express image of his person. So we see also now as we move through these other parts of what it means to be in the uh, express image of God, we see in John chapter 10 where Jesus is talking to, uh, in the temple and he says, I am my Father are one. I don't know how you get much more clear than that. He also talks to them and his disciples in chapter uh, 12 and he says, if you've seen me, then you've seen the one who sent me. And he tells him a little bit later in chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says, from now on you know him and you have seen him. I am in him and he is in me. Again, I don't know how you get any more clear than that. The next part that we, as we dig into the other components of his glory is we see that he had the full glory of God. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we see in Hebrews, the first chapter is referred to, Jesus is the brightness of his glory. Now, let's turn over to Revelations, if you would, the 21st chapter. We see another reference to this, looking forward again. Revelations, the 21st chapter, in verse 23, beginning. All my passages I'll be reading from the New King James, by the way, if you're following along. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it. He's referring to the new Jerusalem. The glory of God illuminated it. So where did that illumination come from? The Lamb is its light. So we see that. We see that the, that the uh, Lamb, that Jesus, is the actual brightness of God's glory, so much so that it illuminated new Jerusalem. So if we look at John chapter 13, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and again, he talks about being glorified. He says that the Father is glorified in him, and that the Father glorifies him, glorifies him immediately. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17, we see that where did that glory and honor come from? He didn't just take it. He didn't just claim it. It was given to him. It was received from the Father. We look at Second Peter chapter 1, verse 17. It talks about that Christ is the riches of His glory, talking about God. Now let's read Philippians chapter 2. It's a final piece in this segment to really make the point uh, and drive the point home. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. Again, I don't know how you get any more clear as to the amount of glory that Jesus had from the Father. The fourth aspect to his glory talks about that he had been given all power and the preeminence above all things. If we look at uh, Romans chapter 11, we see that all things were of him, through him, to him. We see very similar language. Let's go ahead and read this one in Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Again, very explicit. John chapter 1, we saw the same thing, that when he said the word was with God and the word was God, all things were created through him. We look at um, another aspect of that power and preeminence. Ephesians chapter 1, we read that all things had been put under his feet. We also see in Hebrews, let's read this one, Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 8. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he will put... For in that he put all in subjection under him, 
just in case you didn't understand what the first sentence meant, he goes back and says, For in that he put all things in subjection under him, that means he left nothing that is not put under him. Again, very, very clear. He says, But now we do not yet see all things put under him. So again, we see that all things, and just in case you're not sure, that means there's nothing that wasn't put under him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, again, we see all principality, all power had been given to him. We see in the same thing in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, that in all things he would have preeminence. That means the top, the very utmost of all things, the superiority. John chapter 3, verse 35, again, tells us that the Father gave these things into his hand. These weren't just things that he just reached out and grabbed and claimed. So, eternal nature, image of God, full glory of God, all power and all preeminence. Now, I want you to hold that picture in your mind because we're moving to the second phase. And this is where I think we need to look at them together. Humility. Keeping in mind all of the power, all of the glory, all of the preeminence, all of that in his head. He did not set that knowledge aside. He begins this journey, this journey that starts in John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among men. Now, i got to tell you, just that by itself has got to be humbling. If you knew nothing else, that he had came from being the creator to taking on the form of the created. Regardless of the reaction, that has got to be a very humbling thing. But that's not what happened. You see, if he had came as the created and everyone had stood and lauded him and said, Wonderful, we're glad you're here. We've been expecting you for 3,000 years and fell at his feet and worshipped him. Still, would have been humbling to have taken on that form as he created. But that's not what happened. So when we look at what did happen, we look at the depths of humility that Jesus took on when he came to earth and took on that form, first of all, we see that he very clearly came to serve. That was the express purpose, was he came to serve. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 tells us that, and that he gave his life a ransom. That's what he came for. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, said that he made himself of no reputation, He took on the form of a bondservant. We don't use that word very often, but it's going to be very equivalent to a slave that you performed labor as an indentured servant without any wages at all. So the form of a bondservant that he took on. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them to come to him and he tells them that he is gentle or meek and lowly in heart. So again, we see the humility. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it talks about that he was rich, but he became poor for our sakes. Well, how poor? Well, to the point that he tells his disciples in Luke, that uh, to the point where he had no place to lay his head. He said, foxes have holes and dens to leave in. The Son of Man has nowhere even to lay his head. Now, let's get into and look at uh, the washing of the disciples' feet. Let's turn over, if you would, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13 is a story that uh, I believe we're very familiar with. But what I'd like for us to do is to specifically look at verse 3. Starting in verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, first of all, he knew, he knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now listen, take special notice here. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he is girded. And we know the rest of that story as it plays out. Think of the humility, knowing full well as this is going on, that you had came from God with the full glory of God, that you were involved in the creation of all things, that all things have been given to you, and you're sitting down, grabbing a towel, 
and washing your disciples' feet. And I don't know, I'm not an anthropologist, so I don't know a whole lot about the culture, but I got to believe it's not like taking off some athletic socks and your Nikes. I got to believe with the sandals and the roads and the transportation that that was a pretty dirty job uh, back in that day and time. So when we think about that, he went through all of that, all of that humility he took on willingly, and yet the world still hated him. You would think we would stand and applaud that and be so thankful that it's here, yet the world still hated him. So as we look at this now, so how far did that come? Well, how far was he humbled? We see that he was humbled even to the point of death. If we look at the Philippians passage, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, and again, we won't read that for sake of time, that he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. So we see that he was denied, he was betrayed, not only by those that should have been rejoicing at his coming, but by his closest companions. We see that as he was anticipating that death on the cross, it was so real to him when he was in the garden and praying to his father that his sweat was as drops of blood. Again, passages that we're all familiar with. And then finally, we can read about in the Gospels that he was beaten mocked, stripped, spit on, blasphemed, and then crucified. And what's interesting as we look at this is the ultimate display of humility that he did every bit of that without opening his mouth. We find that he didn't open his mouth in front of Pilate. He uttered not a word, Matthew tells us. So when we look at the Isaiah 53, he prophesies that that is the case, that that would be when the lamb came, that he would be led as a lamb to slaughter, would not open his mouth. So why did he leave such heights of glory? And why did he take on such depths of humility? I would propose to you that it's because of his love. John 3.16, a passage, again, that we should all be familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So we understand that passage. I would tell you that it's hard to look at the love of the Son without looking at the love of the Father. And why is that? Because the Son is the express image of the Father. The fullness of Godhead dwells in him. So the two are one. So as we look at these passages together, we clearly see that because of his great love by which he loved us, we see multiple passages referring to the fact that God himself is love. The very definition of love is God. And we see that very, very clearly. We also see in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, that Jesus was the son of that love. We look at the way that he loved us. John 15, 9 tells us that he loved us as the Father loved him. In the very same way, he tells the Father as he's praying that I have loved them as you have loved me. And then what's interesting, and I try to always remember this in my prayers, that as Jesus came and laid down his life, it wasn't just his love for me, which was incredible. But John chapter 14, verse 31 tells us it was his love for his Father. He loved the Father so much that he was obedient all the way to death. So as we look at the final component of this love of Jesus, we find that he loves so greatly that it was to the point of laying down his life. Laying down his life. So when we look at that, we have John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no man than to do what? Than to lay down his life. And what's interesting is we look at the various passages listed there about Jesus saying that he lays down his life is the fact that he emphasizes, I laid it down. I can take it up, I can lay it down, but I laid it down. Nobody took it from me. I willingly laid it down. Not only did he do this for those that love him, that seek him, that appreciate him, but he also did it, Romans letter tells us, for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, he did this. So we look at it, why is that? Because we loved him and we did wonderful things for him and we deserve this? No, we did it. He first loved us. And he loved us 
to the point that he would lay down his life. And John chapter 13 tells us that he loved us, or loved his disciples to the end. So, let's look at this as we begin to wrap up. When we think about the heights of glory that Jesus had, that he left willingly, that he took on willingly the depths and the lowliness of the humility to the extent that he did for a great love for both the Father and for us. It fulfills the prophecy. Isaiah, many, many prophecies, but Isaiah 53 specifically for our lesson tonight talks about all of these things that we've read about. They were part of the heavenly plan. They were prophesied for thousands of years before they happened. We see them come to, come to play and come to pass in the Gospels. Let's read really quick uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. For to, you, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. The things that we have read, the things that we have talked about, the mock, the spitting, the blasphemy, and if we'd have had time, we'd have read through that passage in Matthew and recalled our minds to the intensity of what he went through. Who did he do it for? Well, he died for all. Well, who was all? All y'all. No, Romans 3.23, passages again, we're all familiar with. All of sin. What's the wages of that sin? It's death. It's my sin. I wasn't there. I didn't spit. I didn't mock him. I'd like to think maybe I wouldn't have. I didn't yell crucify him. I didn't cast my lot for his clothing. I didn't do any of those things. But because I sin and break the will of my Father, I need an intermediary to make it right, to be able to stand justified and right and acceptable. That was the plan. If you remember back to Ephesians 1, made accepted in the Beloved. So, I would ask you that as we think about this tonight, can you see the depths of Jesus' love? And what does that mean to you? I'm going to pause here just a second for emphasis. When you think about all the things that he took on, all the things that he knew while he was going through that, think about that. What does that mean to you? Why do you care? Because without it, without that plan being fulfilled, there is no hope. We are eternally separated from God. So this, when you contemplate that, that should leave you feeling very, very similar, I believe, to what the crowd felt in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, where Peter and the other apostles stood up and preached and said, Jesus, the man of Nazareth, was approved of by God by the miracles. You've seen it. You, the Jews, killed him. God raised him. And now he's exalted at the right hand of God. And what does the passage tell us in 37? They were cut to the heart. I think that's what they felt. What was their question? What do we do about it? Men and brethren, what do we do? Is that our question? Do we think that tonight? What do we do? And I think the answer is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. Acts 2.38, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ for the remission of your sins. Paul's response was very clear to that. We see in Galatians 2.20, he said, It is no longer I, but Christ that liveth in me. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, he says, For me to die is, to get, is Christ, uh, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So again, I would ask you, let's think about this as we close this evening. What does that mean to you? What debt do you owe? Is it anything to you? 
we can be of help in any way, brothers, we ask that you come while we stand and sing the song of invitation.